Hello, and welcome back to Columbia University Physics Preceptor TV. Today we're going to discuss uh, experiment 2.2, the potentiometer. Um, so the potentiometer is something very useful when you want to measure the EMF of a battery uh, in, instead of just the voltage. The first idea that you'd have probably when you want to measure the EMF would simply, if you had the battery, would be to simply attach a voltmeter to it and claim that the voltage that you measure here is in fact the EMF of the battery. However, this battery has some, in reality, has some internal resistance. So we can draw this battery instead of as this nice battery that I drew over here, we can draw it as a little box containing some internal resistance R. We then see that if we simply measure the voltage over here, by the loop rule, we're actually not measuring the EMF. We're measuring the EMF minus the current times the resistance. So, in fact, if we want to measure the EMF, we should try to eliminate the current, because if we can measure it a smaller and smaller current, this second term here becomes negligible, and in fact, the voltage becomes uh, approximately equal to the EMF. So the potentiometer is something that we use when, uh, in order to eliminate this current. We want, we're going to actually measure the, the EMF of something without drawing current. So let me draw up exactly what this, um, what this circuit looks like. So this first resistor here is a variable resistor, we'll call it R0. The second he resistor here is a very long wire, exposed wire, and uh, we'll call this point M, this point N, and the point in here is called P. This P point P can be moved around back and forth between M and N. And then this thing down here is the voltage, let's call it, let's call this thing V1 up here, and maybe this one V2, the voltage that we're going to try to measure. Uh, this thing here is a galvanometer, it measures current, and the uh, idea of the potentiometer is to uh, basically move this point back and forth here until the galvanometer reads zero. When this reads zero, there's no current flowing in the lower, uh, lower half here, and you can extract a lot of information about this, um, this cell down here by simply measuring this distance MP. Let's, let's go through exactly how that works. So once we decide on a position P here, we don't need to worry about this entire resistor. We can, in fact, pretend like it's, in fact, two resistors. Let's call this R1 and this R2. Well, of course, when I move this back and forth, R1 and R2 are going to change, but the sum of R1 and R2 are not, is not going to change. So R1 plus R2 is, in fact, fixed. It's just whatever the original full resistance of the entire wire was. So now, if you look at the loop rule up here, if we start up here, and there's some current I going across this, this resistor up here, it flows down here, and by Kirchhoff's law, it has to split somehow between the, a current that flows down here and a current that continues flowing here. But since we've adjusted the point P here so that this galvanometer reads zero, there is no current in the lower half. That implies that this, this current I, is all of it goes in through the second resistor, R1 here, and up back into the battery. So there's no current in the lower half. In that case, the Kirchhoff's law, if we start up here in this, or the loop rule, uh, if we start up here, reads plus V1, because we're passing through this first battery. Here we're going with the current through R0, so it's minus I R0, down here through R2 and through R1, and both of them have the same current I flowing through it, so simply minus I R2, then minus I R1, after which we're back to the same original location. So this sum, or this entire expression has to equal zero by the loop rule. Now what we see is that nowhere in here does R1 and R2 um, appear separately. They always appear together. So in fact, we can write this as V1 minus I R0 plus R1 plus R2 is equal to zero. Or simply, the current is equal to V1 divided by R0 plus R1 plus R2. Apparently, the current that we read that goes through this um, large resi resistor here 
is independent of what the second voltage V2 is, and it's also independent of where we put, put this point P. So al although when we move P back and forth, we'll change R1 and R2, we do not change the sum R1 plus R2 because that is a fixed quantity. So this current, like I said, is an independent of both the potential down here that we're trying to measure and this point P. Um, if, we were to be, if we were to be interested in what this potential is down here, we can look at a second loop that goes through the lower half. So let me do that. In that case, we go first plus V2, and then here we flow again or, or together with this current I, so we lose I times R1. And this has to be equal to zero. So we start basically from this corner here, and we move our way through this loop. Since there's no current in this part down here, there's no, um, there's no potential loss over this resistor. And all the potential loss goes through this second, um, or this resistor up here, R1. So from here, we see that the potential that we're interested in, which is the EMF, because there's no current flowing down here, like we discussed before. If there had been current, we would have been measuring the EMF minus some contribution from the internal resistance of the cell. But since there's no current, this V2 is in fact the EMF that we're interested in. V2 is then equal to I R1. So here we see that although I does not depend on where we put this po point P, um, like we argued before, the, p the potential V2 does because it depends only on R1 rather than R1 plus R2. So if we, if we use these two together, we can see that the potential that we're interested in is in fact V1 over R0 plus R1 plus R2 times R1. Now, this thing here is actually a pretty much a cylinder. And we know from, um, from class that the resistance of a cylinder like this is just um, the resistivity of the material times the length over the area. So this resistance here, R1, we can exchange, instead of using R1, we can use rho L which is the length from M to P, divided by the area of the wire. In that sense, you, you get that V2 is equal to V1 over R0 plus R1 plus R2 times the resistivity divided by the area times the length MP. Now everything in these brackets here is independent of where we locate the point P. So what we see is that the potential that we're trying to measure is directly proportional to the length. So if we know that a certain potential is located at this point, and then if we switch this battery out to something else, it's located exactly half the distance, that then means that that second potential is exactly half as large as the first potential, because both of them are proportional to the distance. So what you're going to do in the lab, you're going to do exactly that. You're going to have a standard cell, which you know the potential of very well, and you're going to locate this point P where this galvanometer reads zero. Then you're going to take the standard cell out, you're going to put something else in that you're curious about measuring, and you're going to find this point P again, and it's going to be somewhere else then. And then by looking at the ratio of those two distances, MP, you're going to be able to discover something about this new cell, that's about this new battery, what the EMF is. So that's the first part of the experiment. The second part of the experiment is actually um, it's quite interesting. We're, we're going to try to measure the internal resistance of these batteries that we're talking about. Um, of course, if you have some battery, like again, we can draw it like, like this, like we did before, and we want to measure the internal resistance, we could simply do what we were going to do before to measure the EMF, simply measure the potential, because the potential we measure would be the EMF minus the current times um, uh, times the resistance, and if we also measure, measure what the current is, we then know what the voltage and the current is, and since we just use this battery here to determine the EMF, we know the EMF too. So by using those three, our knowledge of those three quantities, we can determine what the re internal resistance is. However, we're going to do it in a slightly different way. We're going to um, basically keep everything the same up here, except for this part down here we're going to modify slightly. Instead of having it just look like that, we're going to have so this is a negative end, this is a positive end. We're going to put the battery just like we had before. Um, let's see here. Wait. Just like we had before, like this, but now with a secondary resistor in parallel. 
This resistance here is an internal resistance, and this here is some um, variable resistor that we'll call R. There, we're then going to be able to, by changing R, change the potential that's applied across these two um, nodes up here. So let's say there's a potential V up here. Then, by using the loop rule, we can see that through this lower half, um, if we start, for example, uh, if we start in between here, we go first plus E. Then there's a current flowing, perhaps, as such. Um, this current here goes through the second resistor. So we get minus I times R. Then here, normally, this current would split equally between the, this, this part of the circuit and con continue straight up. But since we've adjusted the, the point P in such a way that the galvanometer reads zero, we know that there is no current up here. So this current I continues around in this lower, in this lower loop. So we indeed get another minus I little r. So we have a capital R from this variable resistor, and then we have a little r from the internal resistance. And this then has to equal zero. So another way of writing this is that the EMF is equal to the current times the sum of the two resistances. Now, if we also look at the potential produced up here, V, V, of course, is equal to the EMF minus whatever is lost over this, um, this um, uh, internal resistance. So V is equal to E minus I little r. If we can adjust um, this capital R here in such a way that the final potential that's produced, instead of just being V, in fact is equal to half the EMF, which we know from part one what the EMF was. Then, in that case, this second uh, equation here translates into um, EMF is equal to 2IR. So this equation, together with this one, we can conclude that the two resistances are equal to each other. So another way of putting it is 2IR, since the left-hand sides are equal, 2IR is equal to I capital R plus I lowercase r. One of the I lowercase r's cancels out on both sides, and what we're left with is that the little resistance, internal resistance, is equal to this capital R that we can read off from the lower, lower part here. So by doing that, uh, we can discover what the internal resistance of this battery is. Uh, the final part of the experiment is in regards to a thermocouple. A thermocouple is something that generates a voltage from um, uh, a, a, a temperature difference. So if you have, for example, one end of it submerged in zero degrees Celsius water and the other end submerged in boiling water, we will be able to um, extract from this a potential difference. And as it turns out, the potential difference for a thermocouple is proportional to this difference in temperature. And that's, in fact, what we're going to verify today. Um, we're going to do that by, instead of having this, um, the battery, that standard cell that we had before, we're going to use a thermocouple in there. And we're going to do the same exact experiment to determine what the potential applied across these two thermocouples is. Uh, the only difference is that the thermocouple produces very small potential, so we can't simply use the same setup as before. In fact, if you remember, we had this variable resistor R0 up here. Um, since we're interested in small potentials, this potential across the MN here that we had before has to be very small. And in order to do that, we had to take away a lot of this potential that this battery up here produces by having a large or resistance here. So we're going to take this, the, the, the box out that we had before here and replace it with a 100 kilo ohm variable resistor. And when we, when we replace that, we're going to um, make sure that we um, adjust it in such a way that the full 0 to 100 degrees Celsius places P right on top of N. Then, once, we have, once we've um, adjusted uh, this resistance in such a way, we're going to be able to change the 100 degrees Celsius water to something else, something maybe room temperature, something else we can measure the temperature of. And then, as a result, this P can no longer be on N because we're producing a different potential, and it's going to occur somewhere in the middle here instead. And in doing so, uh, we can measure the difference in distances and again determine what the final potential would be produced by the second, uh, second uh, vat of water or something, and verify that, in fact, the, the, the potential output is linear, um, is proportional to the temperature difference. That's pretty much the lab today, so have fun and good luck.